Hi, I'm Mary, and now I'm going to show you some sound design and mixing techniques in the Fairlight page of DaVinci Resolve 17. So let's get started. In this timeline, we have all of the dialogue has already been split into the top two tracks. And as you can see across the bottom, we have music bed already in place. And now it's time to work on some of the sound effects. And so right now, there's a drone sound right here at the beginning. And one of the ideas is to fill this entire track with that same drone sound. I'm going to just make sure it starts at the very beginning, as it does right there. I'll expand this track so we can see it a little bit better. And I'd like to duplicate this same clip and lay it all the way across, but there's one thing, I'd, I'd, rather than it just be hard cuts, which may not work well together, I want to make sure that they are overlapping with a crossfade. Now, if you were, if you notice, if I take this clip and I hold down the Option key and just drag it, I will drop a copy of it right there in the timeline. The thing is, if I separate those, you'll notice that it covered up the end of that clip. And the reason is, anytime you overlap clips in the timeline, they're automatically going to just overwrite each other because that is the default editing in the audio tracks. Now, we can change that to layered audio editing by just going up to the timeline menu and enabling layered audio editing. And when you check the box for layered audio editing, it will now edit your clips as you overlap them into separate layers within the same track. Therefore, you can do some nice smooth crossfades in between without ever losing any of the material. And so I'm going to go and separate these and I'll just extend this clip back so we have the entirety of that clip. I'm going to add a fade to this one at the beginning. And I'm going to put a fade on this one also at the beginning so we just have it'll fade in nicely. Now because I put a fade on this, if I overlap these clips, You'll notice now there is a crossfade in between those two. If I were to overlap them without the fade, it will just cut from one to the other. Notice that while we're in layers, and I'm just going to make this track a little bit larger by selecting that track and then holding shift while moving my middle mouse scroller. And you'll see now I can see this even better. I'll also zoom in a little bit more. And as you can see, I can overlap these and I can actually see the waveforms as I'm overlapping so I can align them if I wanted to exactly based on the waveform. So that's a really nice technique as well. So once I've overlapped these where I think they go, I can go ahead and add that fade to this upper layer. Now if I were to look at this under the view menu, show audio track layers, you will see that it shows that this actually is sitting on top in a new layer. I'm going to go ahead back to the view menu and hide those audio track layers. And now I'm going to actually do this more. I'm just going to take the same clip again, hold down the option key, drag a copy, and just drop these on top of each other, aligning them slightly as I go. And what I'm going to get is some nice crossfades all the way across, and I've just made a nice little bed. I can adjust these if I wanted to. I can change their power if I needed to. But the important thing is I've now filled this entire track with that drone sound. And it will sound seamless as I go from one clip to the next. Notice that drone just continues as I play it back. And I can go ahead and put these back. And let's take a look at those audio track layers again so you can see the final result. There it is. You can see there's a bit of a stair stepping as I have created those overlaps all within different layers in the same track. I'm going to hide those audio track layers. So that's just one technique. Something else we have to consider is the levels of this drone is just way too loud. Um, it, even though it's background sound, it's just very heavy, even for a scene in space. So if I play this a little bit, I can see that this is quite a bit of sound. So I'm going to need to turn it down. And I have to decide, do I want to turn it down within the track on the clip levels themselves, or do I want to lower the entire track's level? Now, if I wanted to lower the track, um, Right there, I'll extend my mixer. You can see here's that drone track. By selecting it, you can see it also selects the track right here in the timeline. And I can lower this track level by just dragging the fader. I can do it during playback. And I can lower it to a better level if that's where I want to make the change. You can also do that right here on the track header itself, even if the mixer isn't showing, by just dragging in this field. If you look, you can see this field on the left-hand side. There it shows that's the level of the track at this moment. I can raise or lower that relative to what it was before. I'm going to zoom out, and I'll show you as I drag this up and down, notice the fader 
on my mixer is changing. So whether your mixer is showing or not, at any time if you're listening to a track and the levels are off a little bit, you can finesse those right here from the track header. Or, of course, you can come back over and adjust them on the mixer. Now, generally, it's a good idea to save working with the faders until you're actually mixing the project. Right now, we're just editing in some sound effects and beginning our sound design. And so, it might be a good idea to instead fix the levels of the clips within the track. And so, to do that, first I want to reset the mixer by just double clicking right there on that fader and notice that it just pops right back up into position. And instead I want to select all the, tr the um, clips on the track. And um, what I want to do is I'm just going to zoom out a little bit, select all the clips on that track and go over to the inspector. Now the inspector lets me see the different information about any selected clip or clips. I'll hide the mixer first so you don't have as much showing on screen. That way we can see all of those clips and you can see the inspector. Now notice if I deselect everything and only select one clip, you'll notice that it's showing me this is one timeline clip and it's called low drone number one. If I select all of them, it shows me that I have timeline multiple clips all within that track and instead of giving in the name, that's all it's going to show me is that I have multiple clips. So I can adjust the level right here by raising and lowering this volume slider. As you can see, I can raise or lower that level. You can see it happening right there in the timeline as I drag this back and forth. So I could start playback and listen. Okay, where am I? And lower that level you so it's Q not stepping all over the background, but still gives me that sense of space. And maybe that's how I can lower those levels. Now I can also do it in addition to the inspector. I can also adjust those levels once those clips are selected over here in the clip menu. If you go down to where it shows audio, you can see that you can decrease or increase the levels by one decibel at a time with a shortcut. And on the Mac, it's going to be Option, Command, and minus and equal, or Shift and Option and minus and equal if I want to do three decibels at a time. So I'll try that just to show you. There it is. I can raise or lower those levels of selected clips by just holding the option and shift and just tapping that and I'm doing three decibels at a time. So I could do that even during playback and set those levels. So now I like the levels of the track. And again, I could do it either way, but because I've set the levels of the track, now when I get into mixing, all my levels are set to unity on my faders and I can just begin blending everything together because what's already in the tracks is working. So that was just being able to overlap some clips and build up a bed. Now let's look at some of the other ways that we can bring in some sound effects and work on our sound design. And when it comes to sound effects editing, a lot of people wonder, what's the priority? And in this case, you kind of want to think of it as the diegetic sounds, those ones that are part of the story, the things that the characters can hear, the things that the characters are interacting with, whether it's an alarm or the sounds of them typing on a keyboard or um, their jets of their um, space pod pushing them around. Those are sounds that you can see that the character can hear, therefore those are a priority. The non-diegetic sounds would be things like drone sounds or, or um, embellishments like stingers and some of the things you might do with music or just sounds that are kind of showing what your character might be thinking and how they feel, but they're not as high a priority as the ones that are actually those hard sound effects that really need to be in there as part of the story. So for sound editing, or editing your sound effects, we have some really awesome tools to help you with your placement and also selecting which sounds you might want to work with and seeing how they work in the timeline itself. First thing I want to do is close up my inspector and let's go ahead and notice these markers running across the top of the timeline. These markers are actually a spotting list where the editor and the supervising sound editor or sound designer went through and created a spotting list of some sounds they thought might be good in this particular position or in the timeline. And to do to navigate from marker to marker, you can just hold that shift key and use the down arrow to move down the timeline through your markers or the up arrow while holding shift to navigate up. So back and forth, by just using those up and down arrows. And that will take you to the markers. Now to see what the markers actually say or what they mean, you could double click on a marker and that will open it up and say, it right here it says jets fire, use scrollers, and pod jet sound effect. Okay, well that's a very specific note. But another place where I could see the entire list of all of my notes, what the markers mean, and how I might use them for navigation, I can find that in the index. So let's go up to the index. 
up at the top. And when you open the index, we have an edit index, which lets you see every single edit and even navigate to it if you need to um, for whatever reason. We have our tracks index, which lets you show and hide tracks. If you notice, I have quite a few tracks in here that are hidden right now. And then we have our markers index. And the markers index shows you a thumbnail for each marker, I can double click it, it will automatically go to that marker. Or when you go to the markers index in list view, you'll see that it's going to give me a nice list that shows me different categories. There are all of those thumbnails and I can actually see the name of it. I can expand that if I need to. Now we can customize this list and see more information. I can even expand it if I'd like this way as well. And some of the information in this marker list I don't need is the start and end times of these markers. These aren't duration markers. So I'm just going to right click on one of the column headers and uncheck the starting time code, the ending time code, and the duration. I don't need any of those. Move the color column over. And then I'll just have my name and my notes. And notice I can see all kinds of information here. Double click on any one of these and I can jump my playhead right to it. And I can even sort by these different markers. For example, if I select the color column header, I can sort it by color and therefore there's my two different alarm effects right here. Um, and that's something that we can work with right now is so let's go ahead and try one of these. Let's try this alarm sound effect. By just double clicking on this, my playhead is already in position. I'm going to go ahead and peel this back as I don't need quite as much real estate on this uh, particular thing. And instead, I'm going to hide that index and bring up my media pool. Now, just so you know, I went ahead and hid the index, but you can also have the index and the media pool showing at the same time on the left side by just selecting the media pool and the index. You'll notice the index will now show up on the bottom, which works perfectly well. Now, up here in my media pool, I'm going to switch over to list view and I'm looking for some sound effects. And right here towards the bottom of my project, you'll see there's some sound effects. I have a bin that says sound effects. And inside of this, I have some different sounds that go with this particular scene. Now, the one I'm looking for is the alarm sound effect. And so I'll go ahead and hide the index so we can see this a little bit better. And if you look inside, I have a few sound effects. I have this one that's called alarm. And if I play that, let's hear it. Okay, it sounds like an alarm. Um, and then if I come down here, there's another one that says pod alarm. Now that's more of like a klaxon sound. That feels like a let's clear the building sort of alarm versus a there's something wrong with your pod sound. So I think we'll go with that first one. And what I can do is I can choose to mark in and out points on it, or I can just bring the entire thing into the timeline. Now I need to have a track to put it in. Right now I have two dialogue tracks, a drone and music. Let's go back to that index. I'm going to hide my media pool just to make this easier to see. And inside my index, instead of looking at the markers, let's go back to tracks. And you'll notice that here are all of the other tracks that I have hidden. In fact, I can show them. I've created tracks for different sound effects that we may be using for our sound design. And if you look, now all of those tracks are showing in both the timeline. Let me just squish those up so you can really see them. There, I changed my uh, vertical zoom. And also, you can see them if I open up um, my mixer, you'll see now all of those tracks show in the mixer as well. Now, if I were to hide the tracks, notice that I can hide them and they also are hidden in the mixer. So it just helps you to, you know, when you're organizing or working with things, so you can choose which tracks you see at any given time, which is very helpful. In this case, I'm going to keep all the sound effects hidden. We'll leave the drone and music showing, but I'm going to bring up just the track that says alarm. That's the only one I want to work with. And let's bring up the pod jets as well. We'll just have those three. Good enough for now. Go ahead and hide that index. And now I'm ready to add the alarm to the track that's called alarm right here. All right, so now we have shown which tracks we want to work with. Let's go into the media pool, grab that alarm sound that we want to use. And all I have to do is put it into the timeline where that marker is. So I'm grabbing the alarm sound and I'm just going to pop it into the track right there. At this point, I don't need my media pool, so I'll go ahead and put it up. And I want to zoom in a little bit so I can hit command and equals to zoom in, or I could hold down the option key and use my middle mouse scroller as well. Let's make that a little taller by holding shift and using my middle mouse scroller. So there's the clip. Now, you know what I'd really like to see, though, is it'd be nice if we could also see 
at the same time our video tracks just to know if we are in the right ballpark for how long this particular clip is. Now, I actually said I want to see my video track. This is DaVinci Resolve. DaVinci Resolve has a full nonlinear editor as well as a DAW digital audio workstation all within the same software. And so if I want to see the edit, I don't have to go all the way back to the edit page. I can just show the video track right here at the top of the timeline by just coming up to the timeline view options. Let me zoom in on that. There you go. That's my timeline view options. If I click on that, the very first icon here shows my video tracks. And once I can see those, now I can see the actual clips in the timeline. And so when I can see those clips, that shows me this is the length of this particular shot where the alarm is wailing in Ameliana's ears. In fact, I'll back this up. Let me change this view just a little bit so you can see the video larger. There we go. I'm going to back up just a little before the clip and notice as we start to play. So this is her shot right here. Accelerate. And the clip isn't quite long enough to make it for the entire duration of that shot. So I've got a couple of things I can do to make it longer. I can duplicate it, but I can also use Elastic Wave to just elongate it a little bit, stretch it, and it won't change the pitch, it will just stretch it. But the other thing that's good about that if I use Elastic Wave is not only is it going to make the clip a little bit longer, which I need, but it's also going to slow it down. Because as I'm watching that alarm, I'm thinking it might be nice to slow it down just a little, the flashing, and get the sound to just slow down a bit. So let's do that. I'm going to select this and just make it a little bit larger. There we go. And if I want to slow this down or change the speed, what I can do is I can just right click on that clip and go up to Elastic Wave to engage the Elastic Wave. As you can see, that's what it looks like when you have Elastic Wave turned on. You can see it says Elastic Wave right on it. When you're in Elastic Wave, I can come over to the right side of my clip and notice that instead of just a normal trim icon, I get a stretch, or this is my elastic wave icon, which means I can change the duration of the clip. Notice how stretchy it is, but it does not change the pitch, which is very useful. So if I stretch it a lot, it slowed it down quite a bit. If I make it closer together, Right? But the pitch stays the same, and that's one of the things. I could turn it off and actually make the pitch change in the inspector, but right now I just want to stretch it, slow it down a little bit. Let me zoom out of there. And let's actually make sure that we can see. I want to see the entire clip length, and it looks like I made it, stretched it just right so that we can see the edge. It's, it's made it to the exact length of that shot. So not only did I slow it down, but I also made it the length of the shot. Accelerate. Okay, so perfect. And it ends exactly where I wanted to. So it was very handy to be able to actually see the clips. Yes, I could have watched the video at the same time. This was just another method. I'm going to go ahead and make this a little bit smaller. And the next thing I'd like to do is add a sound effect to match the pod jets as they fire. And I'm going to use another tool for this. We're going to actually bring up our scrollers for this one. So you can see an actual thumbnail of every single frame of your shot, and you can use that as a guide to really match a sound effect exactly frame by frame. And then just use those scrollers to help position the timeline and the clips. And so to do that, first thing I'm going to do is let's go find the sound effect we want to use. I'll go back to the index for just a minute. Um, this is going to be a pod jet sound effect. I'm going to go to my markers index and let's go find that right here. Pod jets to sound effect. And notice my playhead went exactly to the spot. And if you look at the screen, I'm going to full screen mode. Those are the pod jets. This is what we're actually trying to find a sound effect for. Those pod jets. So when they play, when those fire up, we want to actually hear that sound at that moment. So how do we do that? Well, I see the marker. Obviously, the marker is not exactly where we want it to go. That's not a problem. I know which track I'm going to. It's going to be this track right here, um, Pod Jets 1. And I need to go find the clip so I can hide my index, go to the media pool. And right here, you'll see here's my sound effect that we're going to use. I'm going to bring that up. Let's listen to it from the beginning. Sounds like a pod jet, right? Exactly what we need. So I want to just drop it into the timeline for now. I'll just grab it and put it into the timeline. Now, there's nothing magical about what I just did. The fun part is when we bring up the scrollers. So I'll go ahead and hide the media pool. And the scrollers are going to be at the bottom of the screen. 
Um, I'll go ahead and make this a little bit smaller. And let's turn on our scrollers. The scrollers you can find in the timeline view options again. I'll turn that on. And in the timeline view options, the second row of choices you have is your scrollers. You have a video scroller and two audio scrollers. We only need one audio scroller. That will allow you to see the audio for one track and directly compare a thumbnail of the audio to the thumbnail of the picture. And so I'll turn those on, but let you see when I flip them on. There we go. So there is my video scroller and here is an audio scroller also. And I can choose which track that audio scroller is going to show. And in this case, I want to make sure it's PodJets 1. It is showing the track that I had selected, so that's perfect. I could choose any audio track to see in my scroller. In this case, this is the one. So as you can see here in my thumbnail, you can see my different frames. And that's actually representing the playhead. So as I drag back and forth, you'll see, or if I play, notice that's updating to show whatever happens to be on my screen at that time. Now I'm going to um, bring these a little bit closer, zoom in a little bit more, and that way we can see this because I'd like a nice, you have a nice view of the sound effect. So this is the actual sound effect in the timeline. You can see the playhead, and you can see the relationship between them right here in these scrollers. And I'm just going to back up a little bit. And what I'm looking for is the point where they ignite. And as you can see, if you watch that thumbnail, I'm going to use my J, K, and L keys to just move through in slow motion. As you can see, I, right there, it's very clear exactly where those jets fire. Let me zoom in on that to make sure you can see that well. No fire here, and it's just starting to ignite at this point, and now the jets are at full flame. And this is one frame at a time that I can see right here. I can also tell where my playhead is. My playhead is way down here. I'd like my playhead to be in front of this frame, so I just double click on it. My playhead has now jumped to that frame. I can just reposition this if I need to. Um, and there you can see it. And so from there, what I can do, let me jump out, is I can select this clip and I can actually move it into position. So I'm just going to go ahead and move it right there to that spot. And as you can see, the playhead is at the frame where I want this fire to start. And you can see that the audio is starting at the exact place where I want it to. Now I manually dragged that into position, but I could also have used our nudge keys for that. And the, to use the nudge keys, it's just the comma and the period keys. Comma goes to the left, um, period nudges to the right, or you can do multi-frame nudge five frames at a time by holding the shift key. So I'm just going to nudge this into position. See how I'm walking that selected clip right up to the playhead? exactly where I want it. There you go. So now if I play this back, it should be perfect. It. Looks pretty good. Let's watch it in full screen. Backing up. Do it. Do it. All right, and so that's using your scrollers to help position a sound effect. So those are two different things that we can do fairly easily. I'll go ahead and hide the scrollers. We don't need those right now. And then the last type of sound effect I want to do is I actually want to go fishing for a sound effect in the sound library. Now sometimes you may have tens of thousands of sound effects of your own that you use for your productions. Maybe you have thousands of music clips that you have permission to use for your productions. And you need to sort through those and search and go through and find them. And rather than bring them all into your project and then go fish, what you can do is you can index them straight into the sound library. So let's go up and look at the sound library for a moment. Up here at the top, if you select sound library, you'll see that that is the new panel here on the left hand side. Now, if this is the first time you've ever used DaVinci Resolve on your system and you've never used the sound library or downloaded the free sound library, the Fairlight sound library that comes with um, DaVinci Resolve, then you could do that right now by just clicking on the button to download the Fairlight Sound Library now. And once it downloads, you fill in the information and you download it, then you install. And the next time you open up DaVinci Resolve, you will have the sound library here ready to search. And there's over 500 fully sound effects that you can use within your projects. In this case, I have, as you can see, I have the sound library in here already. If I go ahead and click this panel at the top right, this will let me see all of my different databases. In this case, I have a local database and the Fairlight Sound Library is going to be the default in the sound library once you have that installed. Now to see the different sound effects, a shortcut to be able to see everything in your sound library, you just press the asterisk key three times. 
And when you type asterisk three times in your search field, you will see all of the different sounds. And this will give you everything from A to Z. Um, it's quite an assortment. So everything from aluminum can crushing and ant scurrying to, let's go to Z, Zippo lighters, Flicking. <laughs> there you go. So that's quite an, quite an assortment. Now what we're looking for in this case, let me clear my search. Um, what we're looking for is a crashing sound, a sound of, well, beyond crashing, we're actually putting several sound effects to um, emulate the colliding of two space pods. And so the glass breaks on Philip's pod at one point, so I want to actually hear a little bit of glass breaking. We're going to search for it and bring up that glass sound, but I need to figure out what track that's going into and where. So I better go back over to my index real quickly, and let's find where that um, crashing sounds go. Up here where it says crash, just double click that. That's going to take me to the general area where those go. Then I also want to go to my tracks index, and I need to bring up my glass breaking, and I'll bring up all my crash tracks here. I have four tracks that are being used to create that crashing sound. I just made them visible. Um, at this point, I can hide the pod jets. I don't really need to see those. And so here are the different crash sound effects that are being used at the moment. I have three in the timeline at the moment. I can hide the index and bring back my sound library. So right here, I have a track A9, which is my glass breaking. And what I'm going to do is let's find where the glass actually breaks and then figure out a nice sound effect that we could put in there from the Foley library. So if I play this, okay, right there's the sound. Okay, so at the moment, those are the sounds also both from the sound library that were put in there to start to create the sound that we need. What I want to find now is some kind of glass breaking. So right, let me go through it one frame at a time, holding K and just tapping the L key. As I go through there, right there, Philip's head hits the windshield and you see a bit of a crack in the windshield. Um, and so right there, that crash, that's something that we want to hear a little bit of, a gla of glass right at that moment. So somewhere right around here is what we're looking for. Let's go find that glass sound effect. So we're going to come up and just search for glass. And as you can see, there's bartender moving glasses, there's glass tinkings, and glass smashing, and debris. Right? And there's a few different things. There's a golf club hit impact on glass. That's interesting. None of which is exactly what I'm looking for. I want us here um, glass breaking. So let's be more specific. And by the way, when you're searching, it's searching all fields, but they could be just by name or if there's descriptor, it can search by the description as well. So here we go. I have two different glass breaking sounds. And when you're working with a sound library, instead of just manually dragging it in here, you can actually audition a sound. In order to do that, you have to first select the track, and wherever the playhead happens to be, that's where the sound is going to drop into the timeline. So let's try this first one. I'm just going to select the glass break. If I want to play it here in the sound library, I could just press play. It's definitely a glass breaking sound. If I want to drop it in to audition it, all I have to do is click the audition button. It's going to put it right into the timeline on the selected track, and then I can play it through. OK, it's a little excessive. But it does sound like a glass breaking. I'll give it that. All right. Now, if I'm not certain I want to use that, what I can do is I can just click Cancel or select another sound. And if I select a different sound, notice it disappeared from the timeline. I can now choose a different sound if I want to. Let's hear the second one. Let's hear the second one over here. Okay, that might be a little bit, it's a little more subtle. I just want a slight cracking. I don't want it to be so... You know, obviously it didn't shatter the windshield and Philip didn't just float out into space. So I think less is more. Let's go ahead and try that one. I'm going to audition it. And I can drop it just randomly into the timeline. Now we have another choice though. Instead of just dropping it in the entire piece, I'm going to undo that or just cancel that. And instead, one of the things you can do is you can actually set a sync point. So you can tell it an exact frame of that sound effect will match to wherever your playhead happens to be. Let's do that. So I'm going to come back over here to the sound effect, and I'm going to find right there in the middle of that sound effect. Right, let's see, after the first clink, like, let's see how there's several peaks there. Let's go right on the second peak. That's where I want the sound effect to sync up to my playhead. And I'm going to come over here to this button that shows, this button right here is set sync point. 
As you can see, you could set an in point, mark an out point, or a sync point. And the one I want to use is the sync point. When I click that, it's going to place a green playhead on right there. You can see a green playhead right there on my sound effect. That's going to show me where my sync point is. So when I come over to my sound in my library and I start looking at this, I'm going to see the clinking. Notice how he first clinks into that. And instead of being the exact frame where he hits, I'm going to be in a couple of frames as he's starting to pull back. That's what I'm syncing to. And then I'll click Audition. So it puts it into position. And let's see if that one works. Poor Philip. OK. So now, unfortunately, when I stepped out of there, I auditioned it, but I didn't actually commit. And so it disappeared. So keep in mind, don't forget to Put your play where you want it to go, and then make sure you audition. If you like the sound, then confirm. And that way it will stay exactly where it is. Let's see that again. OK, and there's your sound. Then, of course, after that, I could decide if I wanted to change the pitch or adjust the timing or anything like that. But the important thing is, as you can see, you can go through and you can um, work with different sounds right there in the sound library. You can actually create a new database for, let's say, your music that you like to work with, and you can index those right into your sound library into a different database. And let me clear this out. And that's where you could choose a different database. And once you're in a different database, like I am here, I can add any kind of library I wanted to, whether it's my own music different sound effects library that I want to work with or so on, you can index it to another database. You can even make separate databases just to um, bring in all of your different sounds and organize those. And then you can search them all at any time on the same system. So that is working with the sound library. And those are just some of the different techniques we have for working with sound effects. And so next, I want to leave this timeline. And let's go into a different one. I'm going to come down here to something called sound design. Now, sound design is a little more creative, right? Instead of just adding the sound effects, which is also creative and pretty fun, is with sound design, it's where you're taking things maybe to the next level. And you, instead of just taking the sound as is, we have to now craft it to um, achieve some sort of goal, whether it's to make it feel like it belongs in a specific space. Or in this case, we're going to take a voice and make it sound more like a computer. And so to do that, we're going to need to do a little bit of processing or add some different effects and things to it. And you, through that creative process, we can um, create something completely different. And along the way, what's nice is because we're working with DaVinci Resolve instead of just a standalone DAW, digital audio workstation, is we have the ability to have multiple timelines. And we have room where we can just experiment with our sounds outside of our main timeline where our project is still in the project. But instead of going into my main timeline and making a big mess, you know, this is an art form when you're doing sound design. So you can come in here, go to a timeline, try all sorts of things until you get what you want, save that, and just copy the parts that you want into your main timeline. And we can do all that here within a project. And so I'm going to close up the media pool. And let's just listen to the sound. Now, because this is sound, there's no picture. I can go ahead and hide my meters. And at this moment, I don't even need my mixer. Let's just look at this particular track. And this is Ada's test voice, you know, which this was basically a piece of voiceover that was recorded um, earlier. Amelia Newton. Yes. So it's just reading a voice. Now, we want to make this sound a little bit more like a computer. So there's different things that we could do. One of those is we can create kind of a composite image with the sound, similar to what you would do if you were compositing visuals. If you've ever composited um, one shot to itself, to kind of make it richer or you know add a little depth to it, you might just blend it together using some sort of blend mode. You just lower the opacity on one of the you know on the upper clip, but it's the same clip being blended to itself. And we do the same thing with sound by blending a clip to itself. You just lower the volume instead of the opacity and maybe change the pitch a little bit, which is what I'm going to show you right here. So this clip has been unaffected, and what I want to do is select it and let's go over to the inspector. Now, in order to have this play continuously, what we're going to do is just click the button up at the top here, the loop button. It's right there in your transport controls. If you turn that on, that means anytime my playhead gets to the end, um, it will just automatically continue and go back to the beginning and play continuously in a loop, whether you're playing loop playback of a selected area in a range or the entire timeline. 
And so I can start playback. And what I want to show you here is pitch. In my inspector, anytime you select a clip, you have the ability to adjust the volume. You could pan the clip's uh, direction between the two speakers if you needed to. But pitch is the one we're going to be focusing on right here. I can change it higher or lower by up to 24 semitones in either direction. Now, semitones, 12 semitones would be an octave. If you're thinking of a piano keys on a piano, the white and black keys, when they repeat, one octave is 12 keys. And then you get to the next octave, higher or lower of the exact same 12 keys, they're just higher or lower. And then the same thing with semitones, every 12 semitones is an octave. And so I can change that even while it's playing. Liana Newton. Yes, Philip Mingo, Philip Mingo. Gets pretty, pretty deep pretty fast, right? And I can go the other way. I cannot explain this discrepancy. Right? So you can change that and decide which one you want. Now, obviously, those are pretty extreme, but you can also change a voice to sound more like a child. Birth date is March 22nd, 2103. Right? Sounds a little Emiliana more like a child. Amelia Newton. Yes. There. Philip Maida. Philip Maida. So we can have a child computer, or we could go the other direction. I cannot explain this discrepancy. Earth date is... Okay, and so that's just making minor changes. Now, what I'd like to do is let's blend it to itself. So we're going to select the first one in the top track, Option key, and drag down. And by Option and dragging down, I've just made a duplicate directly underneath it in the exact same position. And now we're going to change the pitch. March so while they're playing, at the same time, I'm going to lower the pitch. 2103. Ameliana Newton. Newton. Yes. Philip Maida. So I lowered it by an entire octave, minus 12. Now, if you're wondering, well, those are the semitones. What are cents? Well, since there are 100 cents within <laughs> a semitone, so think of it as in like the American dollar. We have 100 cents within one dollar. You have 100 cents within um, one semitone. So you can make very fine incremental changes as well instead of blending something quite so heavily. But by adding um, a lower version of a clip to itself, you do add kind of a nice low end to it, which really stands out sometimes. The trick is you have to also lower the um, volume. Now, in this case, I've lowered both of them. I only want to lower the one on the, on the bottom. Let's do that. By 12, and then I can lower the volume. Earth date is March 22nd, 2103. Ameliana Newton. There, and you're hearing the two of those blended together. Now I'll go ahead and reset that for now. Just giving you an idea of some of the things that you can do. And by the way, if you want to change the volume level on something, if you've been doing it right there on the clip, you just double click and it puts it right back to where it should be. So instead of doing that, let's leave this one where it is. And instead, I'm and make sure you reset so that it's the, the volume is the same and we haven't changed the pitch. And instead, what I'm going to do is add a plug-in now, which will make it sound like more than one voice. Again, we're going for that computer voice sound. Let's go over to the effects library, and we're going to find a plug-in. And in this case, the plug-in we're looking for is the chorus plug-in, which, as you would think of in a chorus of human beings, it is a chorus uh, plug-in, which will make it sound like more than one voice. Now, when you add a plug-in, you can drop it onto a track or you can put it on a clip. When it comes to clips, you can put unlimited plugins on a clip, but you can only put six on a track. So you kind of have to, you know, manage your plugins as you go. In this case, we can go ahead and drop it right there on the clip. There we go. I just put the chorus plugin on this clip. And by doing so, the plugin shows up here. Obviously, you can see that plugin window. And if you look at the inspector for the selected clip, you will see that the effects tab has been illuminated there. If I select that, it shows me there is my chorus plugin. Now, if I close this interface window that comes with the plugin for making adjustments, you can open that up at any time by just clicking this button right here. That's the custom button. And if you click on that, it will allow you to open up that window again very easily. Just click it. And there it is. So that lets us work with um, these controls. And in this case, um, it's going to make it sound like it's more than one voice. I'm going to use one of the presets right here. And we have several different presets to choose from. We'll use the dramatic one. But if I just start playback, yes. you'll hear it. And let's solo this track so we're only listening to the one with the chorus applied. And then I can play it. Philip Maida. Philip Maida. 
I cannot yep. explain this discrepancy. And that's what it sounds Earth like Day with the plugin. And as you can see, it's kind of got a bit of a computer sound to it now, which is exactly what I was looking for. Now, one other thing when you're working with the plugins, and by the way, when these are all the plugins that come with DaVinci Resolve. If you're working with DaVinci Resolve Studio, you can also use your VST plugins that are on your system and your audio units plugins as well. Now, if you look on this interface, and in addition to having different presets, you can, of course, make your own changes to the controls. You can save presets, new ones. But you will always see a dry-wet control. Let's look at that right here, this dry-wet control. And what that does is this adjusts the amount that you have applied to that particular clip. So if I reset that, it's only 25%. If I do it all the way, that means it's 100% of the sound that we're hearing has been affected. So that's 100%. Ameliana Newton. And this is only yes. 50. Philip Maida. So now I'm hearing half of the clip without an effect and then processed. So it's, it's kind of a nice blend there. So just finding that happy place, <laughs> how much of the effect you actually want. Philip Maida. I cannot explain this description. Okay, that's working for me. So that's great. I'm going to close this up. So we've now made more of a computer sound, not too obnoxious, but just enough of a change. And so what I want to do is I actually want to bake it with those effects in it to be able to take somewhere else to work with. We could even apply one more thing. Let me go up here. Um, I kind of want to lower the pitch just a little bit. So let's go back to audio and let's just lower it by one. 22nd, 2103. So let's just say that's the Ada voice we're going for. So we have it set. We've made a couple of changes to it. And now I want to bounce this. And so when I bounce it, there's several different ways you can bounce. You can bounce, meaning render it into a new file. We can render the entire mix, which means everything from every track or any soloed track. Um, and it will match the format of whatever my bus is that I'm bouncing from. Or I can just bounce the track itself or the the selection, and that's what I'm going to do. We're going to bounce this clip um, as a layer to itself. Okay, so to do that, we'll come up, and I can come up here, and if you look um, up at the top, we can go to the timeline menu, and we can bounce that selected track to a new layer. Um, and if I do that, um, we actually have to select the track first, which obviously I haven't done, and you need to mark a range. And so luckily it will show you if you need to do something like that. I'll use my range tool to quickly mark a range, which I can do. It also selects the track for me, which is nice. Go back to that arrow tool, and I'm going to come up and do that again. Bounce selected track to a new layer. I notice it just bounced it for me. There we go. And that has Ameliana Newton. Now, that has the effect on it, and it's now sitting above the original in a new layer. Now, another option I have, if I wanted to bounce this, is I'm going to um, move this down here, is another option we have is you can also bounce your effects and bake those right into the clip by caching it. So notice this clip right here has that effect that's on it. Yes. At the top, this is the one that has been bounced, but if I right-click on this, I could choose to cache those audio effects or bounce the audio effects. And if I do, any of the effects that are applied to clip right there, whether I have 50, 50 different effects on one clip, I could just bounce those right now and it'll just render out a new file, or I could cache it. In this case, I'll bounce it. Here we go, and just bounced the audio effects that way as well. So whether it was one effect or 50 effects, however many I had on that, it would just render it into a new file, as you can see. So let's listen to this one. Okay, so mission accomplished there. Now, let's say we wanted to take this another step. Let's say I want to um, take this file and now I want to add some e EQ and distortion to it. Okay, I want to take it one more step. Okay, let's do that. I'm going to take the bounced effect and bring it down here. Notice that, I'll put that back for a second. If I look at my audio track layers, you'll see that when you bounce the audio effects, you'll see it sitting right on top of the original and the original has been um, disar disabled right there in the timeline or muted. So that makes it easy for you to move it. You can always re-enable it if you want to. I'm going to go ahead and hide those audio track layers. And let's move this down. I'm going to move it into its own track. And notice if I want to enable the original, I just press D and that will enable or disable that clip. I'll leave it disabled for now. And I'm going to solo this lower track. So this one I'd like to add a little bit of distortion and some EQ to make an effect with that one. Yes. So right now, 
This is my bounced version, sounding more and more like a computer, but let's just put it over the top, shall we? Let's, <laughs> let's go ahead and look at what if we wanted it to sound like it was coming out of a smaller space, like a smaller speaker. Well, to do that, we could work with the EQ that's applied to that actual clip, or we could work on the EQ on the track itself. Now, if you notice that any clip that you select, if you look over here in the inspector, you will see there is my EQ, a four band EQ for the selected clip. So you can do your EQ right here on a clip by clip basis, or let's hide the inspector and bring up our mixer. Another place you can work with EQ is on a track basis, and every single track in DaVinci Resolve Fairlight has EQ built in, a seven band EQ. We have dynamics and then all of your panning built right into the mixer. So let's take this EQ, why not? I've selected the track so I can find exactly where it is. Let's open it up. And what we're gonna do is I'm gonna show you how we can narrow those frequencies because that's what's gonna make it sound like it's coming out of a smaller item. Because if you notice, if you have something like a cell phone and you ever listen to the speaker, you're not hearing really high frequencies and you're never in, in speaker mode or the really low frequencies. You're going to hear the range that it's able to play, right? That one dynamic range, which is usually going to be uh, geared towards voices, making sure you can hear people speak. If you ever listen to megaphones or PA systems, or if you've been at a train station and you hear the announcements, they can't play everything. It doesn't sound awesome, but hopefully it's just the frequencies you need. Right, and that's gonna be by right here in our EQ. If you notice the EQ across the bottom of this equalizer, you'll see it, it basically shows the range of human hearing um, from 20 hertz is as the low end all the way up to 20K or 20,000 hertz. And that's usually the range that you know human ears can perceive. That's why we kind of limit our gear towards that because you're not gonna hear anything above or below that usually. Um, if you can, wow. <laughs> but uh, so one of the things we'll do is we'll turn on our band one and I'll turn on my band six. And you'll notice those look an awful lot like a fade, don't they? It looks like there's a fade in and a fade out. But what that's actually doing is it's just rolling off the highest frequencies and the lowest frequencies. A um, couple things to remember when you're working with frequencies is, of course, there's two, when you're dealing with dialogue, there's two ranges that you don't want to lose when you're starting to narrow frequencies for any reason. And that is down at the bottom end between 100 and 300 hertz is gonna be your clarity of dialogue is gonna be controlled in that area. And between 1K and 3K or 1000 and 3000 hertz, that's gonna be your intelligibility. And so if you shave out too much of the intelligibility, you'll hear that there's a voice, but you won't have a hard time understanding it. And so that's why there's a sweet spot where we can really hear and understand our dialogue. And so as I play this, go ahead and start this playback. Philomena, you can hear the voice right now. Earth date is March 22nd. But what I can do is I can narrow that range in a little bit. I'm just gonna pull down the high end, and what this is, this is a low pass filter. Anything in the shaded area, I'm not going to hear those frequencies. And 2103. Now I've just cut into the 1K to 3K area that I told you not to do for intelligibility. Let me ask you, can you understand this now? Yes. Right, you can hear that there's a voice, but you have no idea what they're saying, and that's because I went in too far. Same thing on the left, this is our clarity area, so I can shave in a little bit of that, but I don't want to dip into that 100 to 300. Philomena, I cannot explain this discrepancy. Earth date is... So I've just narrowed it in, and that's one option I have. Now, another thing you can do with your EQ, since this is sound design, is you can also limit frequencies if you want something to sound like it's on the other side of a wall, and I'll show you that in a minute with some footsteps. So I'll go ahead and shave this off. Now we also have plugins that will do some of this as well. So I'll just take in about that much. But we also have some plugins that will do that sort of thing. I'm gonna add a distortion plugin to this track. Okay, and here's my distortion. Now this will give me a nice distorted sound. And obviously, as the name suggests, I'm gonna choose one of these presets. There's a crunchy preset. March 22nd which is pretty bad, right? <laughs> or here's Megaphone. 2103. Okay, and then let's go in and just do like a low, um, lo-fi radio. Amelia Newton. 
um, not only does she sound like a robot, but she also sounds like she's coming from um, some sort of uh, device, like a speaker. So that's very useful. So now how am I going to bounce this into anything? I'd like to actually bake this into something I could take from here into another timeline and then cut it up and put it into position. Well, if I wanted to do that, instead of bouncing the clip, some of these effects have been actually applied to the track. So what I'll do is I'll bounce the mix into this existing track right here. So I'm going to go ahead and make this track stereo that I'm looking at right here. Change track type to stereo. And that way it will bounce to a stereo track. The, the track I want to bounce into needs to match the bus that I'm bouncing from. And I'll come up here to the timeline menu, bounce mix to track. And what that will do is it'll bounce the mix, which at this moment I have a soloed track. So only what's soloed is what's going to be bounced. That's what I'm going to hear. And I'm going to bounce that too. My stereo main is, the sound coming through my main is going to go to this bounce mix of A4. I'll click OK. It just bounced it for me. I now have a bounced version of what I had just done up above. And so if I were to listen to these back and forth, they should sound identical. Yes. Philip Philip Maida. Maida. Philip Maida. Okay, so that's just how you can take something from nothing and slowly add a little bit of sound design here and there to get yourself to something completely different. And of course, the best part about that is that you have the ability to bounce it so I can then take it to another timeline or work with this. And I always like to name my sound design experiments <laughs> so that I can go back in and find them later in case I want to use it for another project. I've already done some of the experimentation and work at this point. So next we're going to look at some footsteps just so I can show you some reverb and how we can add a little more dimension to our sound. So I'm going to go back into the media pool hide my effects library, and I'm going to open up this last timeline for our sound design. And in this case, I just have some Foley footsteps. Nothing all that exciting, but these footsteps really don't tell us where they are. And so one of the things that we need to do is add either some echo, some delay, or a reverb, something that will give us the sense that we are in a room. And so to do that, what we can do is come up here to our effects library and just apply the effect. And we're going to go down and get our reverb, and I'll drop it right on the track. Okay. Once I've applied that reverb, you can see that it actually shows a space, and it also shows our reverb over here on the right. And then you have all kinds of adjustments that you can make to that. Let's play this and see how it sounds. So it's got a little bit more of a sense of a space in here. Now let's look at a couple of the other presets. So if I come over here and try the bathroom preset, notice it's a much smaller space. It doesn't seem to have as much time, meaning that the reverberations aren't moving in a very large room. Okay, that's the bathroom. Now let's try the cathedral. And you'll notice that all the settings change. It's a much longer time you know, as those reverberations are working their way out into the room, much larger space that we're dealing with. So it just gives us that nice sense of a much larger room. Now that we have some other ones we could choose from, I'll try this one, Studio 2, for example. So it's a drier space, but at least it still sounds like it's in a room. So this is one of those things where you can go in there and work with it. And by just using some of these presets, you can get a feel for um, some of the different settings. On any of our plugins, we have full descriptions on how they work, every single knob in the Resolve Guide, which is available under the Help menu, in case right there in the Reference Manual. So you can get in there and learn more about every single button and knob. One of the things that you can control here is down at the bottom, is in addition to having your dry, wet controls, of how much of that reverb is applied. You also have your direct, early reflection, and reverb. And I'll just show you those really quickly right here. The direct, the early reflections, and your reverb. And those are basically the direct is the signal that's being whatever's generating the signal itself. So if it's a little alarm clock or a little monkey toy that's banging cymbals in the middle of a parking garage, 
that is the direct sound is coming from that. The early reflections is how quickly it reaches the listener. So if you're really close to it, then obviously the early reflections come to you pretty quickly and that gives us a sense of how close we are to it. If it takes much longer for those to get to us, then we know that the source is further away. It's all an illusion on how our ears perceive these things. And then of course the reverb is the reverberation of all the sounds hitting all of the different space, which gives us a sense of scale and also then gets back to the listener. So that's what makes it feel like we're in a large room or a smaller room and so on. So we have all of the, all three of those different elements that you can control right here and you'll see those in this graph. Let me go back to cathedral and you'll see this is the direct is the white line right there. We have our early reflections and then we have the reverb itself. And this is just how much of that reverberation. So how bouncy is the surface? And then of course the time on how long it takes to get there. So that is a really useful, um, thing. And as you can see, but just looking at the different presets will really help you get a feel for how our reverb works. So I'm just going to pick one of these for now. Let's go with the studio. And then the last thing is I mentioned EQ can also show you if something is on the other side of a barrier. So let's say the sound is happening on the other side of the door. Um, it, these are footsteps maybe on some stairs. I'm just going to turn those up a little bit. So this may be someone coming down a hallway or on the other side of a wall and we hear them coming. Well, that's going to change our perception of that because I'm going to open up my EQ. Um, when it comes to the frequencies, the higher the frequency, the smaller or the closer together those waveforms are. They don't have nearly as much power as those uh, lower frequencies, which have massive waves and those actually can penetrate through walls. And so we tend to hear those low frequencies because they can go right through the wall and turn the wall into an amplifier in order to come out the other side. Whereas the high frequency is just going to bounce around and disappear. And so to make it sound like something's on the other side of a wall, all you need to do is just shave off some of that high end until you achieve what you're trying to do. So for example, whether it's glass or concrete or someone downstairs, just start your playback and you start band six and just start shaving that back. I'll crank up my gain just to make it a little louder for you so you can hear it while I do this. And let's pull that band six. As you can see, now it sounds like they're on the other side of, you know, somewhere else basically. And I could even change my reverb if I wanted to, let's make it a bigger sound like cathedral. Now they're coming up a stairwell or something, but way on the other side of a wall. So that was working with some of the sound design tools for doing your sound effects. So it's just a matter of knowing which tools that you want to wield in order to craft the sound to get um, what you're looking for.